Welcome back to the podcast. Today, you guys are in for a really special treat. Um, I have Shelby here with me, and she is a cricket farmer. And so before I started hitting record, I was just talking to her um, about how how I met her. So I'm friends uh, with a couple of people on Instagram, like real friends with people on Instagram who I haven't even met in person. And this one gal screenshotted her page to me and was like, Sasha, like this girl would be up your alley. I think you should give her a follow, like check her out. And so of course I did. And I started creeping and I thought it was like the absolute coolest thing. And so I'm like learning and I'm watching your videos. And then I don't remember if I reached out or if you reached out, but I was like, we need to do a podcast interview. And so here we are today. What do you think? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, I'm still very appreciative to that friend for pointing you in my direction because um, it was really exciting to, to finally connect. Yeah, I thought so too. So um, I'm going to mute myself here, but if you could go ahead and tell the listeners kind of, we'll start with like who you are and a little bit more about you and your story. Yeah, so my name is Shelby Smith, and I always say I've been raising bugs and convincing people to eat them since 2018. Uh, all of that being said, believe it or not, I did not grow up wanting to be a bug farmer. Um, in fact, that was probably the furthest thing from my mind growing up. Um, I grew up on a, a traditional family farm, corn and soybeans, just northeast of Ames here in central Iowa. And growing up, wanted zero to do with agriculture, zero to do with farming. My brother, who's four years older than me, was obsessed, started driving the tractors when he was like five. You know, he was into it. I, on the other hand, you could put me in a tractor cab for about 10 minutes, and then I would be climbing the walls, and my dad would be calling my mom and telling her to come get me because I was just a terror. So... I wanted nothing to do with it. Honestly, didn't want to stay in the state of Iowa. I was on a jet plane out of here as fast as I could. Um, I grew up playing all sorts of sports, so soccer, basketball, um, trampoline and tumbling, all of that kind of stuff. Ended up choosing basketball as my main sport and uh, went to college on a full basketball scholarship to St. Joseph University out in Philadelphia. So that's a mid-major division one. Um, university in the Atlantic 10 conference. So went out there, um, started off as a psychology major with a pre-med track because I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Changed my mind shortly into my college career and decided I didn't want to go to med school um, and I didn't really want to be a psychology major anymore either. So I went to my academic advisor and uh, she said, well, um, we can't waste your brain on a marketing or a management degree. So you get either accounting or finance. And I said, okay, I'll choose finance. Cause I definitely could not see myself being an accountant. No offense to any accountants out there, but just not my deal. Um, so ended up graduating from St. Joe's with a degree in finance and then was lucky enough to be part of a program called sport changes life where I went over to Ireland um, it was a three-part program, so part education, so I have a master's degree from an Irish university, um, part service, so we coached in underprivileged areas, and then we also got to continue our playing career. So I played professionally in the uh, Irish National Professional League. Um, so I have a master's in finance from Trinity College in Dublin. That was only supposed to be a one-year program. Uh, I was supposed to be back in the States a year after I left. But I fell in love with the country, fell in love with the team I was playing with, and I had a brand new master's degree, so I thought, you know what, let's try and use that. So I agreed to play for another year with the team I was with and went looking for a job. So I wound up on a brand new trading desk that had just been established in Dublin, um, and I wound up trading equity derivatives for a Canadian bank for about three and a half years before I started looking around in the office working 14 hour days going, you know what, I don't want this to be what I do when I grow up. So I'm going to leave. Um, so I handed in my notice and moved back to Iowa in October of 2017 without a plan other than I was going back to the farm to possibly learn how to farm, even though I said I would never farm. Um, so my dad and I, we went through that first harvest together and, um, you know, it's no secret to anyone in the Midwest, the farm economy has been pretty rough for the past, you know, seven plus years. 
So after harvest, my dad and I started having conversations about the future of, you know, what was I going to do? And that he said, you know, I've been doing this for over 30 years. You don't have to fight the same markets I have. There's all sorts of different niche markets out there. If you find one that you think you can do, let us know. We'll help you get started. Uh, fast forward a couple months and um, I sent both my parents an article about a woman raising crickets for human consumption. And I said, hey, I think I can do this. And then 10 days later, um, I bought my first 10,000 crickets and the rest is kind of history. <laughs> <laughs> that's so like, that's a nutshell version. I'm sure we can dive deeper into like a lot of those, but okay. So cricket farming, how, how much research did you put into looking for like a niche market before you decided like crickets? Like what was it about that article and that woman that spoke to you? Well, so, um, you, you know, the, the niche conversation came up on a, when we got a, cause it was around Christmas time when we were having this conversation and we got a basket of maple syrup and like maple syrup products. So I think there were like maple syrup candies. There was the maple sugar, you know, all those kind of things that you get in one of those Christmas gift boxes. And my dad said, you know, you need to find something like this, something that's small, um, you know, with bigger margins and that kind of deal. So I listen to a ton of podcasts and have listened to podcasts probably since 2015 on a fairly regular basis. And so um, three separate podcasts that I had been listening to fairly regularly in the month of December of 2017 had talked about eating insects, whether it was just like flippantly, they did it while they were traveling, or there was some advertisement for um, a company that contain crickets or something like that. It came up a couple of different times, which is what my initial exposure was. And then I, I can't even remember why I went searching for articles about crickets, but I did. And I just remember it was January 1st of 2018 and it was like minus 27 degrees outside. It was my first winter back in Iowa. You know, Ireland doesn't really have, um, super rough winters. It's very rare to get snow. They're right on the ocean. So it, it's very temperate. It doesn't, it doesn't get below freezing very often. So it was quite harsh for me to come back to minus 27. Let's put it that way. Um, mm. And so that was what put it on my radar. And the more I read about it, uh, the more for my finance brain, it looked to be a supply and demand problem. You know, people, their companies were constantly sold out of crickets. Um, and so I was like, oh, perfect. I can raise the crickets for those companies. And that was initially my plan was to raise crickets for these companies. But um, in that first 10 days before I bought my first 10,000 crickets, couldn't really get anyone to have a meaningful conversation with me about becoming a supplier. So eventually I just said, screw you guys. I'm going to make my own products, <laughs> which is what happened. <laughs> so why 10,000? Like, why is that the magic number to start with? Um, I don't know that it was a magic number. <laughs> um, it was just, uh, from a population standpoint, from the initial, uh, very crude, very uneducated, um, spot that I was coming from in terms of entomology and rearing insects and things like that. The number that I had seen from a uh, genetic pool standpoint is you didn't want to have less than 3,000 for genetic diversity purposes. So I figured mm. let's multiply that times three because I figured I was probably going to be pretty bad at raising them the first time. So I was going to kill some of them at the very least. And so I might as well give myself three times what I needed. <laughs> so what kind of prep work did you have to do to bring in these 10,000 crickets and, and like what ages were they? Yeah. Great question. Uh, back then, I had no idea what kind of prep work. I was really making it up as I went along. There are some YouTube videos out there that exist. None of them are very high quality in terms of, of actually raising crickets and raising them at scale. Um, majority of the really good resources are for people who have exotic pets. So think like lizards and toads and spiders and all sorts of other things that you get to feed. Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. So those were like the first resources that I had for actually raising them and keeping them alive on a small scale. But in terms of actually scaling it, I was kind of on my own on a lot of that because uh, it's just, it's not done very commonly. So um, 
I like to say there was a lot of trial and error involved. I had these, basically what I had, I bought the 10,000 crickets. Um, and I think everybody always asked me what those cost me out of curiosity. And I think it was $140 plus shipping for my initial 10,000. Oh my gosh, that's like nothing. Like I, I know. Like, yep, no, exactly. Probably so. like a, a grand, a couple grand. Yeah. <laughs> No, nope. yeah, one hundred and forty dollars, and then um, had that. I had um, these, so I was raising them in these eighteen-gallon storage totes that I bought at Tyson's, you know, the farm supply store, and then I had a metal shelf from Sam's Club. So I think all in, like my initial startup costs were maybe two hundred bucks. 300 bucks, something like that. Very minimal in comparison to uh, getting into other sort of livestock. That's technically what these are. Um, so that was my initial prep work. And then at that point, it was just kind of hit the ground running. And I, I swear in the last two, two and a half years, I have not, um, haven't quit learning. There's not been a single day that I haven't learned something or had some epiphany about why something isn't working. So that's probably part of the exciting thing though, is like, it's, it's fun and exciting. You're learning, you're trying new things. And I think that's another perk of, you know, kind of being an entrepreneur or business owner and in a field that nobody really, like I have, I didn't even know that this was a thing for human consumption. Like I've, you know, I've grown up around animals my whole life. So like cricket consumption for other animals was like, oh yeah, duh, they do that. But you don't ever think about as for humans, you know, so I, I find this just so fascinating and, and you can really, I think, scale this. So, okay. So you have your first 10,000 crickets. How many survived that, that batch until you had to process them? <laughs> so they were two weeks old when I got them, which do you have any concept of how big a two week old cricket is? No, that's the other thing I was going to say, like what, I don't even know like a cricket's lifespan or it, like if they, like how crickets like hatch or like birth, like I don't know anything. <laughs> yep. No, don't worry. Neither did I. Um, I had zero <laughs> idea. And so my first 10,000 crickets came in these like relatively small boxes for what I had pictured of what 10,000 crickets would come in. And they were really well taped up, which I didn't entirely understand at the time. Um, but as soon as I cut the tape, I understood exactly why they were- Crickets taped. everywhere? Crickets <laughs> everywhere. They were teeny. <laughs> yeah, it was. So that's why I say I bought 10,000, but I would say, generously speaking, I probably got 6,000 of them where they were supposed to be because um, the other ones, they were just gone, and it, I was not prepared, um, so whoops, but then, just throw, throw like 70 bucks in the air and put a match to it, so. exactly, pretty much, <laughs> um, by the end, though, honestly, I did way, did, threw way more money into the wind than that, because I think I maybe got a thousand of them to the finish line, um, to where they were, large enough to harvest. So it, first round was pretty rough, let's put it that way, but I still ended up somehow by sheer dumb luck at this point, I swear, got them to lay eggs and hatch babies and um, kept on trucking. So it was, but it was definitely a learning experience. So let's talk about that part, like, like cricket anatomy 101 like what is a cricket like what type of insect are they like an exoskeleton uh, cr or insect if i am i saying that right <laughs> <laughs> don't worry that's not what i i so i have done um a couple of different talks to like groups of entomologists and i always say that i have this really really giant imposter syndrome problem when I'm speaking in front of entomologists because my uh, knowledge of anatomy of insects in general, let alone crickets, is is somewhat shameful considering that I raise them for a living. Um, so yes, they have exoskeletons. That was correct. Good. Uh, <laughs> I don't know they, why. I even know that. I'm like, they, are they related to crabs or something? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> no. So that actually, that is a really, I'm glad you brought that up um, because, you know, you were saying earlier, you never think about eating crickets or eating other mm -hmm. insects but um the so one of the warnings on the back of all of my products on the labels is if you have a shellfish allergy you might potentially have a reaction to crickets um that's because crickets and other insects are all made of the same things that 
shrimp and lobster and all of those sea bugs that you don't even think twice about um, mm -hmm. are made of. So there is the possibility of having having reaction if you're allergic to crustaceous shellfish. But yes, they have exoskeletons. Um, they are, I won't even try to tell you what uh, family, phylum, whatever, all of that they're in. You don't have to do the, the technical <laughs> name. I'm, I'm like, no, the was, basic anatomy, how do yeah. they reproduce? What's their yeah. lifespan? What's their size? I know there's different breeds of cricket too, like difference between like a, an edible cricket versus like a black cricket, or I don't even know what the names of them are, but I know that there's different types of crickets. <laughs> yep. No, then that's, that's good that you at least know that part. Yeah. I try to stay away from the technical stuff. And that's always my first thing when I tell a bunch of entomologists is I'm sorry, I call them bugs. So that should tell you right off the bat where I'm coming from in terms of my scientific knowledge of actually insects and all that goes on. Um, so I do, I raise Acada domesticus, which is the common house cricket. Uh, so if you are at all familiar with specialty pets and the crickets that you need to feed them, they're those little brown ones that you get at the pet store. So you're right, they are not those black crickets that most people are used to seeing outside. Um, those are the field cricket. So these are the house cricket that are originally native to Southeast Asia. So they are a non-invasive species in all 50 states and therefore can be shipped across state lines live. It's one of only two breeds in the U.S. that you're allowed to do that. But uh, because they're native to Southeast Asia, they don't survive anywhere in North America out in the wild because it just ends up getting too cold for them. These ones, they once the temperature goes below 80 degrees, they become very unhappy very quickly. So um, they have a softer exoskeleton than your black ones as well. Because one of the common questions I get for better or for worse is, are these like, you know, there's those black crickets, they're so crunchy when you step on them and you squish them, like are these the same crickets? No, they're not. They have a softer exoskeleton, uh, much more pleasant to eat. And the other thing about those black crickets, if you're gonna eat them, which I don't ever suggest that you do, please make sure that you treat them like wild snails where you're gonna finish them on like cornstarch or something to clear their gut of anything they could have potentially eaten that would be harmful to you. Uh, but even, like I said, even with that clearing period, I would not recommend that because you don't know where they've been. They could be full of mm -hmm. pesticides and everything else. Um, so stick to the crickets that are raised specifically for human consumption. But in terms of life cycle, um, it's about 45 days from hatch to fully grown. That varies widely depending on the conditions that you have them in. Um, I've had crickets turn as fast as 30 days uh, just from manipulation of conditions. Um, the females, so one of the big things that always comes up is chirping. Um, you know, what is going on with that? So that the chirping is actually only done by the males. So that's something for you to remember. If you ever have a chirping cricket in your house, it's really annoying. 100% of the time, it's a male cricket. Oh, so that makes perfect sense, though. <laughs> if you think about it, because like um, like birds, me and my husband were just talking about this, like birds, the, the males are the ones that always sing. So like even when you hear like birds outside, they have like a really pretty voice. That's the male because they're trying to attract a mate, you know, and the, the males are always like the colorful one because they're trying to impress the female. And the females are usually like smaller and dull and make like not attractive noises. <laughs> Yes, no, exactly. And that's, um, that being said, I think the female crickets tend to be a little bit bigger and I could be totally wrong in that. It's just anecdotal observation. No, but you, it, you might be right though. Cause I think like, and I think that's just for like birds, but I think insects, cause like female spiders, I believe are larger than their male counterparts. So that might be, I might have to look that up. Yeah, I'm going to have to look that up. That feels like one of those facts I should know as well, but I don't. Um, so yeah, so the once the males start chirping um, and the females have a fully developed ovipositor, that's when it's time to breed. So for the majority of the life cycle, I would say of the 45 days from day one until about day 40, those crickets are silent. Um, and then they start chirping once they are mature. Uh, they mate, and then the females will lay between five and ten eggs per day. So things can get out of hand pretty quickly. Luckily, for about the first 18 months, I was really good at killing baby crickets, so I didn't expand my population too fast. 
um, for better or for worse. Uh, I learned some hard lessons that way. Oh, goodness. Um, yeah. Well, they say the saying goes that if you've not um, killed at least 100,000 crickets, you're not a real cricket farmer. So uh, good to know. Yep. Now you <laughs> so know. I'm going to. I'm going to ask the ridiculous question of mm -hmm. how do crickets mate? Like what, what does that look like? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. I actually uh, got really lucky and was able to, able to capture it on video the other day. And I put it in a, I had started a YouTube channel um, all about like cricket farming and I'm following the life cycle of these crickets that I have just cause you know, it's a really common question that I get, of, you know, what does the life cycle look like? where do you get your crickets, all that stuff. So it's a great opportunity for me to educate people on something that most people have never seen. So I, Absolutely. Cap I captured the actual mating process. And so what happens is the female mounts the male and then, well, obviously the male chirps and attracts the female first. Um, then she mounts the male and then they have these, I do not know the technical term for them. So I call them sperm bags because I don't know what else to call them. Um, so the male has like the sounds same. Legit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sounds good. Everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about is my point. Um, so the male has this little sperm bag that he like brings outside of his body. The female has her little sperm bag as well and he transfers his sperm into her little sperm receptacle thing and then she brings it back up inside of her and she actually doesn't need to be fertilized for two weeks after that she can lay fertile eggs for those next two weeks just off of that one fertilization so oh, wow yeah it's kind of crazy it's kind of crazy so then how many eggs on average do they do they lay and then how many of those eggs like survive? What's the like incubation period? What's that look like? Yeah, so each female lays between five and ten eggs per day. Um, a lot of this obviously is theory because I don't go in there and count all of the eggs that they lay. <laughs> but I wouldn't yeah. expect you to, but yeah. No. <laughs> um, so each female lays between five and ten eggs per day, uh, supposedly up to a thousand in their lifetime. Um, and then, uh, it's about 11, nine to 14 day incubation period before the babies start hatching. Um, and the babies are called pinheads and they are teeny tiny. Uh, so crickets don't have a larval stage in, in so much as like, they don't have like a, they don't look like a worm or a maggot or anything like that. When they hatch out, they look like little tiny crickets. Um, which is cool. I appreciate that fact because I'm not huge on the whole worm side, um, <laughs> but just personal preference. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it's, um, it, the babies are a challenge because um, if you have the environment too dry, they don't have a fully formed exoskeleton at that point, so they'll dry out, but you also can't have it too wet or too damp because if there's condensation around or sitting water or anything like that, they are so small that they'll drown in a droplet of water. So they are a challenge, um, but luckily at this point, I think I've kind of started to figure them out. And at the end of the day, the females are very prolific in their egg output. So even though I would estimate that maybe 30 to 40% of the eggs are viable, but even so, you know, if you're looking at a thousand over your lifetime from one cricket, that's 400 eggs that are going to be potentially viable from one cricket. So it's hmm. pretty exponential. That's incredible. Okay. So <laughs> what did you think when you walked out and you're like, holy smokes, these crickets are drowning and they're all dead. Or holy smokes, all of these baby crickets just dried out. Like, how did you come to the conclusion that it was too dry or too wet? Um, I saw that they were dead, proceeded to make the same mistake about mm, five more times. And then was like, oh, wait, maybe that's what it is. Um, that seems to be the running theme is like, I will make the same mistake over and over and over and over. Um, and then for whatever reason you know, conversations with somebody else, just, uh, I've actually piggybacked a lot off of, um, other kinds of livestock. So like hog barns and, you know, chicken, chicken barns and all of that things where, where livestock is reared on a mass production kind of thing. Just speaking to those kind of producers, like they're basically in the same kind of game I am. 
um, controlled conditions, you know, trying to figure out what the optimal population density is, like what is the total carrying capacity of a particular space, like all of that kind of stuff. Even though most people don't think of raising crickets as raising livestock, like it is very similar. It's just on the mini scale. So um, many of those conversations, although they might now seem very obvious to me, like, yeah, of course you need to have better airflow through there or you're going to gas them. Um, it just sometimes took me more times than I would like to admit to figure out that was the problem. Well, sometimes you get too close to the problem that you just can't see the solution too. So you have to come at it from like a different perspective or somebody has to say, oh, did you try this? And you're like, no, no, I didn't. But now that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, several conversations have happened like that. Um, and like I said, still, even two years into this are still happening. So yeah, um, yeah it's been interesting. So, okay, so the babies, they hatch and you're growing them. I think you said it was zero to 45 days that they're at harvest or 45 days they're at harvest. So what does, for our listeners who may not follow any type of farming, what does harvest mean in general? What does harvest mean to you? And then what does that look like in terms of cricket farming? Yep. So harvest is uh, finding out how, how often you screwed up <laughs> um, <laughs> is the way I would like to look at it. Um, <laughs> comparison of what you expected to get versus what you actually did get. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, kind of the, so harvesting them obviously is, is the killing of the animal, um, eventually, but you just harvest it just like you would harvest any other animal. Um, although they are killed in the freezer, so they just go to sleep and then never wake up. So as far as killing an animal goes, I'd say it's pretty humane. Um, but so harvesting the crickets, you got to separate them from um, their their frass, their poop. Uh, most people don't even comprehend the amount that crickets or other insects poop. Uh, for every pound of crickets that I raise, I get between two and seven pounds of frass. Holy so, smokes. They call yeah, it frass, yeah. like F-R-A-S-S, -S, or how are yep. you saying? Okay. F-R-A-S-S, -S, correct. Um, Interesting. Yeah, so that stuff is actually really, really powerful though as a fertilizer. Um, pot growers really like it because it makes things flower faster. And then if they're, <laughs> if they're illegal as well, they are tightly regulated on what they can, um, what they can put on their plants. Um, mm. And it functions, helps to kind of function as a, a natural pesticide as well because it it basically emits a reaction within the plant that the plant thinks is under attack and being eaten. Mm. And so it shores up its defenses so that it doesn't get eaten quite as badly. Um, and then, like I said, it, it is like a hyper flowering sort of a mechanism as well. Um, so if you actually went on Amazon right now and, and Googled or not Googled Amazon searched, um, cricket frass, you wouldn't find it for cheaper than 10 to $15 a pound. So it's, it's very potent, very powerful stuff. Um, so there's that revenue stream that comes on that side too. But so then harvesting them, you guys separate them from their frass and then they go into the freezer in my processing facility, which is about half an hour from my cricket castle where I raise my crickets. Um, cricket castle. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, keep going. Um, so yeah, so then at that point they're frozen to kill them and then they go through the processing. So um, my first step is I boil them to a rinse them and b make sure that they are food safe. So they're like any other protein, you know, you don't just eat most most people don't just eat steak or chicken or anything like that raw. I mean, obviously there are certain occasions in sushi and uh, steak tartare and all that kind of stuff, but for the most part, you don't do it. Um, mm -hmm. So I boil them to make sure we get rid of any sort of pathogen and then they're dehydrated until they are nice and crispy dry. And then at that point, either they are tossed in seasoning and packaged or they're ground into a powder to be put into my energy bars or my uh, sold as is as 100% cricket powder. Um, so that that is the way I process them on my side. I suppose I didn't 
didn't mention, didn't talk about. Uh, so in my in the beginning, I started raising the crickets in my dad's break room in his shop because it was double insulated for noise, which meant it was good for keeping things warm as well. Um, but I sold out of every cricket I raised in 2018, so it became clear that I needed to get more crickets. Um, so I built my cricket castle, which was actually a single wide mobile home trailer that was going to go to the landfill. Uh, but I saved it <laughs> and we turned it into my cricket castle. Um, so, this is just perfect. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, so that my cricket castle was capable of turning out um, 5x the amount of crickets that I could originally raise in the break room. So that should have been problem solved, kind of, sort of, um, except for I still sold out of everything because, you know, I started to gain some awareness and people really liked what I was making. So I still needed to figure out how to get some more crickets. And um, very common here in Iowa are contract grower models, you know, so all of the poultry, all of the swine, eggs, all of that is done through contract grower, um, even the dairy. So basically you have these producers who are, you know, raising the animals, getting the eggs, um, you know, milking the cows every day, but then they sell that to sell those raw agricultural products to a processor to then do it that way. So I started to piggyback off of some of those existing models and um, now have a network of contract growers. So I have a total of seven growers right now with two in the pipeline, so I'll take me to nine. Um, three of them have crickets on board. One of them has already been through my cricket rearing course and is under construction. And then there's three others that are going through the course in the next month that will then start construction on their own uh, cricket castles, if you will. So uh, that's oh. the way. Go ahead. No, I was like, that is genius. It's just like, a, I mean, the other way that you could look at this is kind of that multi, multi level. So like you're here and you're having people contracted to help you, you know, expand and grow. I love it. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a, I would think of it kind of like a hub and spoke sort of a model. Um, you know, I really, I had two ways of looking at it of I could just put up a bigger building and raise all of my own crickets in one spot and hire the labor um, to, to take care of said crickets and expand that way. But, you know, in terms of risk mitigation, what's going to protect me from having a tornado coming through and, and taking out my entire supply, you know, what's going to prevent disease or anything, you know, things happen. Um, so that's kind of why I like having a network of growers that are in different geographic locations. Now they're all in the state of Iowa because, you know, transportation does cost. So there, there is an element to that. I want to keep them within the state. Um, and I just think we're really well positioned as a state with, you know, having an abundance of farmers who are constantly looking for some sort of diversified income stream that's not corn, soybeans, you know, cows, sows, and plows, like something beyond those three. Um, so it's cool to, to have sort of an unlimited pool to draw from that way too. So how did you start branching out to contract more people? Did you just like put it out to your community or was there somebody that you were talking to? How did, how did these people become part of your cricket castle? Yeah, well, so my first two, um, one of them, he, so they live about half an hour north of where I am. And he actually came down with a friend of his to look at my dad's strip till machine. This was January of last year, I think, was when Andy came down. And, you know, he had crickets were not on his radar when he walked in that door. But by the time he left, he was asking me questions and everything. This was before I had decided I wanted to do contract growing and all of that stuff. Um, you know, I think I might have flippantly mentioned that I was thinking about doing something like that. And I would say not a month later, he brought his wife and their three kids down to come look at the crickets. And they were pretty serious about when I was ready to go for having people raise crickets for me that they wanted in. Um, so that was my first one. And then my second one, I was at the uh, vending at the Iowa City Farmers Market. And um, it was a fairly busy day. And I had a guy come around who was another vendor and he stopped and he said, you know, I've had a lot of 
articles written about me. I had a bunch of articles written about me when I was like two months into doing this. I had no business being written about because I didn't know what I was doing. And I look back at some of the things I said and I was like, oh, you had no idea. Um, but so he had re written or he had read some of those and had seen a couple videos about me. I kind of followed along on the story and he stopped and he said, hey, um, can I raise crickets for you? And I was like, sure. Like, I don't know who you are, but yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and so then he left and not 10 minutes later, um, his wife came around and said, hey, my husband's really excited to meet you. Like, he, he really wants to raise crickets for you. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, I'm really excited that somebody's excited. Fast forward a month and I was having a ribbon cutting party with the Ames Chamber of Commerce for my Cricket Castle. And uh, Frank and Brenda drove two hours from Iowa City over here to my ribbon cutting. And at that point I was like, oh, these, they're really serious. Like they do really wanna do this. Um, so those were my first two growers and I always affectionately call them my guinea pigs because they are, um, you know, for better or worse, they. They have been my guinea pigs as we all figure out how to really structure this and make it work for everyone involved. So uh, those were my first two. And then after that, I applied for the Iowa Farm Bureau had a new competition this year called the Dream Big Grow Here grant competition. And it was open to um, specialty, specialty egg producers. Um, it could be across a whole bunch of different um, types of businesses. And so I applied for that last fall and then made the top 10 final and then made the top six. And the top six, we got to pitch at the uh, Iowa Farm Bureau Young Farmers Conference back on the 1st of February, which now looking back with everything that's happened, that was really lucky that we even got that in. Um, so I got to stand up in front of 618 to 35 year old um, farmers and talk about my business and my plans and all that stuff. So uh, three of my seven growers have come from that, um, which was pretty cool. And then my other growers, it's either been word of mouth or uh, one of them, I spoke at their kids 4-H club, one of their meetings. Um, so it, it's kind of been a lot of, a lot of outreach stuff on my part and then a lot of word of mouth sort of things. Which is incredible. That's, in that's incredible though. I love that. That's just, no, every part of that is amazing. So, okay. So these people, they help you or they grow crickets for you. Do they process them or do they ship them to you live or what's the, how does that work? Yeah. So they deliver them to me live. So it, again, it's no different than any other livestock. Um, you know, I'm taking live delivery of the animals. Um, and then it, I process them from there. So I, I pay them by the weight of the crickets that mm. they give me. Um, and then, uh, but so I provide the feed so they don't have to worry about the feed bill. Basically what they're, they are dealing with equipment and equipment, labor, utilities. That's what their responsibilities are. The feed I, probably helps keep things consistent though, in terms of like consist like consistency in, I don't even want to say like texture maybe, or taste, things like taste. that, I'm assuming. Yep. Yeah, no, that is feed is my number one quality control sort of a thing. Well, I mean, it's not, no, it actually probably is number one. Uh, it's one of the biggest factors that impacts taste and everything else. So, um, so part of it is that, you know, I, I need them to use the feed that I, I want them to use. Uh, and then additionally, having been through two years of this, I, and knowing, um, how big of a risk it is to even start cricket farming. I wanted to de-risk it as much as possible for my growers. Um, and this is just a good way for me to do it. So they don't have to worry about that. Um, the other way that I'm, I de-risk it is I basically teach them, I send them through a two day course that I call my cricket rearing course where they come in, we go through everything from harvest to hatching, to breeding, to daily chores. And then um, I send them home with a 40 page cricket rearing manual, which is like the Bible of raising crickets. Uh, that being said, it's always an evolving manual. Uh, I would say it's a working document, so things change. Uh, there's 25 supporting YouTube videos of how I do things. 
Um, but I always tell them, you know, this is the way I do it, but please think of this more as a collaboration than anything. If you come up with something that works better for you or that you think would work better for everybody, you know, please feel free to share that. And and because efficiency is the name of the game and I will not sit here and pretend like I am the utmost expert and it's my way or the highway on this. Um, the other thing is, it's not like a, like a, you know, if you go into a hog contract with a Prestige or a Smithfield or somebody like that, they have specs for a barn that you have to put the barn up to those specs and have this technology and all that stuff. They have it down to a science. They know what works and this is, you either do this or we're not doing the contract. So everyone else that I brought on as a grower is, you know, converting an old barn or an old farrowing, you know, old farrowing barn, just a, a regular old barn, um, a loft in a barn there. So everybody's conditions and everybody's structure is different. So that's a little bit of an added challenge um, working around those parameters because it's not as cut and dry of like what works in my facility may not work in somebody else's facility because they may have taller ceilings or shorter ceilings or, you know, X, Y, and Z. So it's always a challenge when you're bringing somebody else on to have them adapt to what works for you. So yeah, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, as you expand, okay, one second. I'm wondering if as you expand, you will find, you know, conditions that are, you know, maybe some of those parameters like a Smithfield. Yeah, you know, that ultimately that is, I suppose, the goal in some respects. Um, is to be able to figure out some sort of standardized process. Uh, but that is quite a long ways away. You know, the reason that Smithfield's doing that or Prestige is doing that or Iowa Select, the reason they do that is because the um, the market size is there to support it. So they're, you know, they, they have all the infrastructure around it and I hate to point this out, but they have the subsidies around it too. That's one one common uh, complaint I get from people is that, you know, gram for gram in terms of protein, like crickets are, are way more expensive than chicken or something like that. And I say, yeah, well, how many subsidies do you know of for a bug farmer? Because I don't know of any. So if you know of any, please let me know, first of all. Um, and second of all, you know, we're, we're not trying to be the chicken of the world, you know, the cheap the cheap protein that way. I would compare us more to seafood. So like shrimp and lobster and those things are quite expensive as well. So um, yeah, it's a, there's lots of different ways to look at it. But yeah, I suppose eventually the goal is to be more standardized in the process. I just don't know what kind of timeline we're looking at to get there. Yeah, well, I think it, it, it'll come in due time and you'll know just kind of like everything is unfolded for you. I have no doubt that one day you'll just be like, oh yeah, this is the next step. So um, to start kind of wrapping this up, I would love to talk about the food part of it. So like, what, what would you compare? I know you just said like the seafood and stuff like that. Like what types of food do you sell? What types of products do you sell? Um, how can people use these in their household? Things like that. Yeah, good question. Um, so I do three different product lines right now. Um, so I do whole roasted crickets, which are roasted and seasoned. I compare those often to sunflower seeds. Taste and texture, they're not far off. They're a little bit airier than a sunflower seed. Cross between sunflower seed and a corn nut. Or if you've ever had um, roasted chickpeas or roasted soy nuts, they're all very similar, um, but they look like the cricket. So not everybody is on board with that, which I totally get, which is why I made my second product line, which are energy bars. So that's where the crickets are ground into a powder and mixed in. If I didn't tell people that there were crickets in those bars, I would say nine out of 10 people would have zero idea. Um, it's a very unoffensive taste. It blends very well. Uh, the powder is so finely milled that 
you know, I sometimes get people who are like, oh, there's a little bit of crunch to that. And I'm like, well, that is all in your head because I promise there's no crunch left. Um, so that's the second line. So I have different flavors of both of those. And then the final thing, which I think is honestly is the most versatile, is the 100% cricket powder. So what you can do with that, you can bake with it, you can mix it in smoothies, you can mix it in hummus. Um, one thing I kind of like to compare it to is flaxseed because most people that I know are not looking to pick up a spoonful of flaxseed and just throw it in their mouth. Um, same thing with cricket powder. You just wouldn't do it. It wouldn't be super pleasant, but it can blend well, like I said, into smoothies, bake with it. So you can do bread, you can do cookies, basically any kind of baking recipe that you have. You can't substitute it out one for one because it's very dense. Um, but you can do about 25% cricket powder to 75% whatever flour is called for. So you could do gluten-free, you can do paleo, you can do all of those. Um, you're just going to substitute it 25% of the cricket powder. So that goes in basically anything. So really the possibilities are endless with the 100% cricket powder as far as what you can do with it. Um, I recently made uh, what I call chocolate chirp cookies and took them to the post office because postal workers have shipped like 100 packages for me in the last 30 days. And I uh, felt like, and they always tell me that they're hungry for crickets, but when I leave, and so I said, careful Chocolate what you wish for. Chirp. Yes. <laughs> I love <Chocolate> that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, and it's, there, I'm always developing new flavors. Um, I will be sending out, I have 15, designated taste testers that I ran a competition for to select those 15 that will be receiving um, five taste tester bars hopefully early next week. I'll be making them tomorrow if my ingredients show up today. Um, shipping to them to get hopefully some new energy bar flavors out there to people. Um, but yeah those are those are the three main products and um, honestly Sales are split about 50-50 between the energy bars and the roasted crickets. The people who become fans of the roasted crickets uh, are fans for life and incredible advocates for them. It actually makes me laugh because um, they just, they're very passionate about getting other people to try them, which I very much appreciate. That's so, I'm going to have to try some of those cricket ones because I'm, I'm a big sunflower person, especially in like this time of year, like when it starts to get nicer out, you want to be outside because you can just like spit them wherever. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sure there's no spitting with the, with the cricket, so you probably just pop them in your mouth and chew them up, I'm assuming. Exactly. Um, yeah, think of it like a, a sunflower seed, but you don't have to put the shell out. I like that. Okay, and what flavors did you say you have in those? Um, of the roasted crickets, I have... Salt and pepper, hot and spicy, barbecue, dill pickle, buffalo ranch, and fiesta. So there's six of those. And then currently for the energy bars, I have chocolate mocha, apple cinnamon, and salted caramel. So, so you have quite a variety. So, okay, um, as far as like shipping and things like that go, um, do you just have it all like online? How do people, how do people order this stuff? Yeah, so currently I have um, all of that stuff is available on my website through my online store. As long as you're in the U.S., uh, I do have a lot of people from Canada that are really trying to get me to start shipping to Canada. And one day I will, I promise. Um, I just got to figure out the whole customs thing and everything else. Um, so right now I ship to, I can ship to all 50 states. Uh, I launched that store in December because my processing facility was fully licensed by the state of Iowa as a food processor in November, uh, the day before Thanksgiving. I call it my Thanksgiving miracle of 2019. Um, was licensed November of 19, and then my online store was launched December of 19. And since then, I have shipped to 40 states to date. So I have 10 left that I'm trying to fill in. Um, I saw that on your Instagram the other day. I was like, oh, she's so close. <laughs> I know, I know. Right now, the only one I have holding out west of the Mississippi is Louisiana. So I really need somebody from Louisiana to order some cricket. But um, that'll come eventually. But yeah, so the shipping and everything has been its own adventure. Uh, but... 
And as I move forward, I'm sure that'll look very different in six months or so as volumes pick up. Um, I am available in Ames at the Wheatsfield Cooperative, so our local co-op here. You can also order, if any of your listeners are members of the Iowa Food Co-op, you can now order crickets off the Iowa Food Co-op. Um, I'm hoping once things start to settle down a little bit, I will get some grocery store managers to have some decent conversations with me about bringing on new products. Uh, they're all very stressed right now, which is very understandable, and um, have basically shut down any new vendor sort of a thing. Which, like I said, I understand where they're coming from, but it's quite frustrating for me as I'm trying to grow my business. Yeah, I think it's just kind of a weird time for for everybody. So, okay. So I have two questions left for you. And the first one is what has been the biggest, cha- sorry, it's getting to be nap time. So everybody's like whining at me. Um, what, what's been like the biggest challenge, the biggest struggle since starting this business? And then how can people, where can they find you? How can they learn more? And how can they buy your products? Sure. Um, so first question, what has been the biggest challenge? Um, I'm going to split that kind of in two because I feel like there's two sides of my business, uh, the growing side of actually growing the crickets and then the convincing people to eat them side, uh, which, cause they both present their own challenges. So on the growing side, um, I think that my biggest challenge is in front of me in terms of managing growers. Uh, that has been quite interesting, even just with the three, the three growers that I have crickets on board with already. All three personalities are very different. All three management styles are very different. Um, so that has been a challenge for me that I guess has, has been good. Um, has made me question some days as to whether I can bring on 10 this year like I want to bring on or if I need to cap it at a smaller number just so I can manage everything. Um, but I think that's good. If it's, if it's not, um, if it's not challenging me, it's not changing me, I guess, is one way to look at it that way. And then on the convincing people to eat them, so the selling the cricket side, uh, you know, in some ways you'd think that convincing people to eat bugs is the hard part. It's not really, you know, an ounce of education, like really goes a long ways. And as long as I can get my message out there, get in front of people, it really hasn't been that difficult. At the end of the day, I'm not going to get everyone. um, And that's fine. I, I would just like to, at some point, hopefully capture a certain percentage of, of the market that eats seafood because I think that's an attainable market. Um, the hardest part as of recent, you know, is just what everybody's going through of how do I j- adjust to this new normal um, of, of not being able to be in front of people. So for example, one of the one of the selling tactics that I have are I have these stickers that say I ate a cricket that normally when I'm doing a farmer's market or I'm doing a talk to a Kiwanis club or a Rotary club or something like that, if somebody samples one, they get a sticker. That becomes um, twofold a good thing for me because one, everybody wants a sticker. So there's a little bit of peer pressure in there. Like if four out of five people have the sticker, you know, that fifth person is pretty, pretty likely to, to want a sticker as well. Um, and then the second element is as soon as that person puts that sticker on, they become an advocate for my business because they'll forget they have it on. So they'll go eat lunch at some restaurant and the waiter will be ask them about, you know, did you really eat a cricket? And then they launch into this story about, yeah, I really did eat a cricket. It really wasn't as bad as I thought and blah, 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 blah. Um, so that is taken away from me. So it's figuring out how to navigate that, like what opportunities are there for me to share my story uh, now online via, you know, things like the YouTube channel, like uh, corporate cricket tastings via Zoom, um, all sorts of things like that. So that's been been hard and I think will continue to be hard, but at the end of the day, it's still an opportunity. So um, 
and then your second question, where can you find me? Um, so I have Facebook and Instagram. Um, just search Jim and Eat Crickets on both of those. Uh, I will be doing a couple giveaways here shortly, so go check them out. Um, you can find all my products online at www.jimandeatcrickets.com, and that's G-Y-M-N-E-A-T crickets.com. And um, other than that, uh, reach out to me. If you ever feel like messaging me, you know, um, please do. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. So. I love that. Okay. So I lied. I have one final <laughs> question okay. and that's how did you come up with the name of this Jim and yeah. Eat crickets? Yeah. Um, that actually, I get asked about that a lot of like whether I came up with it or not. And I did in fact come up with it and I was laying in bed at night. Um, before, obviously before I had started this or had decided I was going to start this and was trying to figure out a name. And, um, I was going back and forth with one of my friends and we were just spitballing names. And I was like, what about Jim and eat crickets? Like Jiminy, but Jim and eat. And, um, I remember writing it down on my nightstand that night. So I didn't forget it. And then I remember talking to my mom the next day and she's like, mm, I don't like it. And I was like, mm, I think I'm going to do it. <laughs> so, um, I've stuck with it. I maybe at some point will rebrand my consumer side of it because it the the name and the logo uh has proved to be somewhat intimidating to people who are not gym goers and are not exercisers so they think that it may not be for them um mm -hmm. so yeah which is a little bit of a bummer to me and it's one of those uh thought patterns that i don't quite understand um but i you know i the goal is not to be exclusive to people who go to the gym because at the end of the day we all need protein it's the building blocks of all of our bodies so um trying to make it more approachable for everyone so there might be some sort of a branch off at some some point uh i think jiminy crickets will always be the overarching company uh but we might have different brand streams but that'll be a couple of years down the road as well <laughs> yeah you could just probably do some product lines and call them different I, I don't even know, target different people based on what you call it, I suppose. Exactly. So, I love that. Well, thank you. This was, I feel like I could keep asking you a million questions, <laughs> but I know that we are coming up on time and I do want to be respectful of, of your time. So thank you for taking this and doing this with me. I am fascinated and I'm going to go online. And I'm going to order like one of everything <laughs> right now because I was actually going to do this prior to our, uh, our uh, interview today. But I honestly, I, I think we had just talked about this the other day, a few days ago, a week ago, and I just had not had the chance. And I was looking through my calendar the other day and I was like, oh man, I'm talking to her this week. I was going to buy some of her stuff so that I could talk about it on the podcast too. So I'm, um, I'm going to buy it and I'm going to try it and I'm totally going to talk about it on social media too. And, and I'm excited. I'm very excited. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I do very much appreciate it. <laughs> All right, um, guys, I'm going to also put Shelby's information in the show notes. So what you can do is just scroll down and click on any of the links to either her website or her social media accounts. That way you guys can go follow her, learn more about crickets and her cricket products and cricket farming and how... <laughs> I just, I love, love, love this. So thanks again. And yeah, we'll talk soon.